Good morning, St. Ansgar Baptist Church. Open with me in your Bibles to Habakkuk chapter 2 as we talk about put on your faith specs, as in your faith classes. Let's pray, and then we'll look at Habakkuk chapter 2. Father God, we commit this morning to you and pray that you would be glorified. I pray that you would take your word and challenge us by it. I pray you'd fill me with your spirit as I communicate your word. And I pray that you would do only the work that you can and reach through the camera to the hearts and lives of the people who are watching. God, I pray that we would even have a visitor who is watching this right now and that you would open their eyes to grab a hold of you, to embrace you in this crisis, and that they would call out to you and be born again, or that they would find comfort and strength in whatever crisis they are going through. God, we commit today, we commit this morning to you and pray that you would fill us with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, on Labor Day weekend, 1950, Mount Pleasant hosted its first ever Midwest Old Threshers reunion, and has done that every single year since. Emily grew up going to Midwest, the Old Threshers, and she has loved going and I have had the wonderful privilege of getting to go with her now. And every single year that we go, I'm always drawn to this blocked off area where a guy has a whole bunch of chainsaws and several old stumps of wood. That's because as I go over there, what the guy does is he takes chainsaws and those stumps of wood and he turns them into masterpieces. If you can see it right here, this is a wolf that he carves out of an old stump and with chainsaws. Here's a beautiful bench. This is an eagle back here. Here are two owls on a tree branch, and this is a beautiful fox. You know, what looks to most like just an old piece of wood looks to the carver like a beautiful animal. They see what we don't see, and by faith, they slowly chip away until the animal, until the picture becomes clear. The reality is, in a crisis, we need faith specs. By faith, we need, we need glasses to see what God is doing. That's why our big idea for today is, by faith, we can walk through a crisis patiently. By faith, you can walk through a crisis patiently. And so you need to put on your faith specs, and point number one, look to God for answers. Put on your faith specs and look to God for answers. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1 says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself at my tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. You know, in Habakkuk chapter 1, Habakkuk wrestles with the character of God. He looks at the injustice that's going on in the nation of Israel. And says, God, why aren't you being aware of this? Why aren't you going to do anything? And then he looks at the facts that what God's going to do is use Babylon, a wicked nation, to punish Israel. And he goes, God, that doesn't seem to fit with your character. And so he pours out his complaint like we looked at last week. And then he says, I'm going to look to see what God will say to me. You know, people who live by faith pray with expectation. They believe what one commentator said, that God does not mumble. That God answers prayer clearly. You know, when you're facing a crisis, embracing God by faith means that you believe God's word and obey it no matter how you feel, what you see, or what the consequences may be. And so point number one is we need to put on your faith specs and look to God for answers. Point number two, put on your faith specs and wait on God's timing. Look at verses 2 and 3 of chapter 2. It says, And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on the tablets, so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits for its appointed time. It hastens to an end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. You know, in chapter 2, God reveals the future destination of Babylon. And it's not pretty. But patience was needed because it didn't actually come true for almost 80 years. From the time that Habakkuk got this, it was almost 80 years until it came true. You know, I wonder how many of you, as you go through a crisis, maybe as you go through this crisis, need this point 
that you need to wait on God's timing. You know, in a crisis, we often want the answers right away. But think about this. By faith, Noah waited 120 years for the flood. By faith, Abraham waited 25 years for Isaac. By faith, Moses waited 40 years to deliver the nation of Israel. By faith, what do you need to wait on God for? As you go through a crisis, put on your faith specs and wait on God. You know, on January 26th of 1882, Charles Spurgeon preached on this text, Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The title of his message was Watching to See. And as he got to this passage, this is what he had to say. He said, The tarrying of truth becomes the testing of the people. The tarrying of truth becomes the testing of the people. What his point was, is your faith is built or it is discovered to be strong or weak on the lapse of time. So put on your faith specs. Look to God for answers. Wait on God's timing. And then thirdly, put on your face specs and live while you're waiting. Live while you're waiting. Look at verses 2 and 4. This is so good. Verses 2 and 4 say this. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on the tablets, so he may run who reads it. Now some translations say, so he may read it while he runs, basically. But then look at verse 4. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous will, now here it is, live by his faith. The righteous will live by his faith faith. You see, some Christians suffer from the paralysis of analysis when it comes to living by faith. That's why some of your translations here in verse 4 say the just will live by his faithfulness. Because belief and action go together and you need to get that. Belief and action are two sides of the same coin. One commentator even said, when we walk by faith, we live on the promises, not the explanations. You see, God wanted Habakkuk to make plain the words that he was writing because God's word is meant to be heard and lived. And that's a problem that some of you face is you love hearing God's word, but then you overanalyze everything and you don't go out and live it. But when we are in a crisis, God calls us not to simply live in this, uh, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? It's a, God, I am trusting you and I am continuing to live. You see, faith isn't the high schooler praying that God will tell them which college to go to because he only get, they only get accepted into one. No, faith is the high schooler who applies themselves in high school, studies carefully, applies at colleges, and then prays to God for wisdom. Faith moves. It lives. That's why in James chapter 2, James goes, You say you have faith without works? I will show you my faith by my works. Because true faith works. And that's why the reality is faith in a crisis is expressed in confident living. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 10, and we can get a picture of this. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 through 39. Hebrews 10, 32 through 39 say this. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those who were treated, so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accept, accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession. Notice how they have those faith specs. They have a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For, now here's a quote from our verses today. For, yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. See that? Hebrews chapter 10. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Verse 39, Hebrews 10, 39. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but are of those who have faith and preserve their souls. You need to put on your face specs in a crisis and you need to look to God for answers. Point number two, you need to wait on God's timing. Point number three, you need to live while waiting. 
And point number four, you need to see the future of sin. This is the majority of our text, verses 5 through 20. And I want you to realize that letter A is greed will never be satisfied. The future of greed is not satisfaction. Look at verse 5. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 5. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he never has enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. You know, Babylon in this, in this time when Habakkuk is writing, they had just recently broken from the power of Assyria and they were out for vengeance. Like Napoleon, the power-hungry tyrant of France, they had an insatiable greed for power. But listen, you cannot satisfy your greed. And in a crisis, often our greed comes to the forefront. But when we have faith, we realize greed cannot be satisfied. Greed for pleasure, greed for a perfect church, greed for no problems, greed for money, greed for power, greed for whatever, it won't ever satisfy you. And that's what this text teaches us. Listen, greed is the torture chamber of the proud. It's the prison locked from the inside because no matter how hard you try to satisfy your greed for whatever it is, it only grows stronger. The chains grow heavier and the prison grows darker. Because the very thing that many people pursue for their freedom is what enslaves them. And so you need to, with faith, see the future of sin. Letter B, you need to realize that dishonest gain will make enemies. Dishonest gain will, will make enemies. Verse 6, Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? And loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble? Then you will be spoiled for them because you have plundered many nations. All the remnant of the people shall plunder you for the blood of man and the violence to the earth to cities, and to all who dwell in them. You know, recently, Ems and I watched the first season of Marvel's Agent Carter. Maybe you've seen it. But in it, the multi-million dollar Harold Stark says, you don't get what to where I am without making a few compromises. You know, Babylon was like that. She was a crooked pawnbroker, is how one commentator described her. A crooked pawnbroker who lent on inflated terms. Like the people in the temple who Jesus drove out, Babylon was a house of thieves. But if you gain money dishonestly, you'll find that Galatians 6, 7 through 8a is true. It says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. And so when you have faith, even in a crisis, you don't resort to sin. You see the future of sin. That first of all, greed will never be satisfied. Secondly, the dishonest gain will make enemies. And thirdly, that dishonest gain hurts the home. Look at verses 9 through 11. Woe to him. So th this section, verses 5 through, oh, verses 6 through 20, there are five woes. Or, or articles of judgment, you might say. This is the third one, or the second one. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork will respond. Listen. Dishonest gain ruins the gain no matter what era you live in. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28. Go check it out. There are three ways to make money. You can steal it, you can earn it, or you can have it given to you. Steal it, earn it, or have it given to you. But greed cuts corners. Greed will take that option of stealing it. Greed sacrifices family time. Greed never rests and greed is never satisfied. 
And that's why we need to realize that dishonest gain hurts the home. When you live for dishonest gain, you will hurt your home. You need to take the warning from Jesus Christ very seriously. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So you need to see the future of sin. Realize that greed will never be satisfied. Dishonest gain will make enemies and it will hurt your home. And then abuse of power will create nothing lasting. Abuse of power will create nothing lasting. Let's look at verses 12 and 13. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? You know, Psalm 137 verse 1 says this, By the waters of Babylon there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. The nation of Israel was persecuted under Babylon. Babylon had a massive wall surrounding the city, so big that you could actually have a four-horse chariot run around the top of this wall. It was huge, but it was a wall that was built on slaves' blood and sweat. Warren W. Wearsby says this, What man builds without God can never last. We can't exploit people made in God's image and expect to escape God's judgment. Listen, you can't exploit people made in God's image and expect to live without God's judgment. You see, those who live by faith realize that people are always more important than, pro than products or projects. Jeremiah 51 verse 58 has this same uh, prediction for Babylon. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The broad wall of Babylon shall be leveled to the ground, and her high gates shall be burned with fire. The peoples labor for nothing, and the nations weary themselves only for fire. Babylon's wall that was so beautiful, Babylon's wall that was built on the abuse of power ended up being completely destroyed. Listen, abusers whether it be sexual, physical, verbal, pastoral, or political, treat people as objects. And I want to challenge you. How do you treat people? Are people merely objects for what you can get from them? Are they merely objects for what they can give you money-wise or pleasure-wise or whatever it may be? If so, that is the mindset of an abuser. But those who live by faith view people as image bearers of God. And so you need to see the future of sin in a crisis and realize that greed will never be satisfied, that dishonest gain will make enemies, it will hurt your home, that the abuse of power never builds anything that lasts. And letter E, that alcohol will lead to shame. Alcohol will lead to shame. Look at verses 14 or 15 through 17. It says, Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup of the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon, Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them, for the blood of man and the violence of the earth to the cities and all who dwell therein. You know, it says in verse 5, if you go back to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 5, it says there that wine is a traitor. You know, when I was living in Waterloo, I met a man who in one night almost destroyed his marriage. He had gotten drunk, slept with a woman who wasn't his wife, and found out this verse to be true. Wine betrayed him. At St. Anne's Baptist Church, we've recently removed the article in our statement of faith about we will refrain from the use and sale of intoxicating drink as a beverage. But realize that that is not an endorsement of alcohol. That's us realizing that God has called each Christian to have their own personal beliefs based on the Word of God. 
But let me challenge you to look up what scripture says about alcohol. It comes with many more warnings than blessings. I can guarantee you that. Just this week, a young man who I went to college with reached out to me because like the prodigal, he was finally coming back to God. However, alcohol had led to a lot of shame in his life. He was going to cry, or he's going to cry, when he realizes that God, like the prodigal father's like the prodigal son's father, that God is running to him with open arms, yet he's going to bear the scars of the shame of foolish decisions. We need to realize that alcohol leads to shame. You see, Babylon was a partying city. So much so that in Daniel chapter 5, while the Medes and Persians are invading the nation of Babylon, Belshazzar throws this huge party and says, let's drink it up. And completely wasted, God comes with his finger and writes the handwriting on the wall that says, you've been tried in the balance and found wanting. And Belshazzar's strength is drained from him. And later, Daniel comes in and he says, hey, you're toast, bud. And that night, hung over from all of his alcohol, he's killed and loses the kingdom. Alcohol leads to shame. And it's really easy in a crisis to run to alcohol. And many people, that's what they run to. But we need to realize, by faith, the future of sin. What we've seen so far is that greed will never be satisfied. Dishonest gain will make enemies. Dishonest gain will hurt your household. Abuse of power will create nothing lasting, and alcohol will lead to shame. Let's look at letter F, the last one. Idolatry never delivers. Listen, idolatry never delivers. Say that with me. Idolatry never delivers. Emphasize the never there. Verses 18 through 19. What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies. For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake! 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 It's silly. To a silent stone, Arise! Can this teach? Hold, it's overlaid with gold and silver and there's no breath in it at all. You know, Babylon was a cesspool of idolatry. I went through and looked up all the idols. Here are just a few. Anu was the chief god. He was the heaven god. Elinol was the air god. Enki was the god of the deep waters, or wisdom. Ishtar was the goddess of love. Sin was the moon god. Shamasha was the god of power or strength. Adab was the god of storms. And then you have Nurgle, and another really long name. And they were the rulers of the underworld. They were the god of plagues, fevers, and maladies. And then Marduk, you probably heard of that one. That was the sun god. But we don't worship idols, right? Now, the reality is we do. One man described an idol this way. Think about this. An idol is anything that you have that you cannot give away. Anything you have that you cannot give away. Think about this. Warren W. Wiersbe says, I've met people who so idolized their children and grandchildren that they refused to let them consider giving their lives for Christian service. What are you not willing to give away? Is it your kids? Is it your job? Is it your home? Is it your finances? That's an idol. That's an idol. John Calvin described the human heart as a factory of idols. And you know how scripture says you should treat idolatry? With mockery. (laughs) I couldn't believe this, but think about this. Elijah told the Baal worshipers that they should yell louder because perhaps your God Baal is pooping. And you're like, oh, pastor, it doesn't say that. It actually says he perhaps he's relieving himself. Elijah says, it's ridiculous that you're worshiping an idol because it can't do anything for you. You had to form it. And the reality is, today, we still have idols in our lives that we formed. You made that child. You got that job. You had to contribute to that 401k. How in the world can you worship something that you had to make? 
Idols are stupid. We need to realize the folly of idols. In Isaiah, he mocks the idol maker because the idol maker takes a tree, cuts it in half, splits part of the tree, throws it into the fire, burns it, and then with the other part, he makes it into an idol and worships it. How does that make any sense that the same clump of tree that can get burned and be worthless is something to worship? And yet we do that in our own lives, don't we? Don't we do that? That things that we create, things that we build, we worship as if they are somehow going to lead us home. As if they are somehow going to bring us comfort. But you will always find that idolatry is foolish. Especially those who have idols of a 401k. How's that idol serving you right now? Listen, you need to put on your face specs. Realize that you need to look to God for answers. Point number two is wait on God's timing. Three, live while waiting. Four, see the future of sin. And five, believe the promise of God's glory. Look at verses 14 and 20. We skipped over them on purpose. Verse 14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Look at verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple in heaven. Let the earth keep silence before him. You know, the greatness of the glory of God is manifested first and foremost in him taking rotten sinners and making them righteous. Today, if you're watching this and you've never become a follower of Christ, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 and realize that the glory of God is expressed in taking your sin and placing it on Jesus Christ and giving Christ's righteousness to you for free as a gift of grace. Christ died for you. And the God demonstrates his power because there is no sinner so far gone that God can't say, I will forgive you. And Christ bears our sin. But for Christians, whether it's COVID-19 or another crisis, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Turn there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And this is what we need. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 18. Verse 16 through 18. So we do not lose heart. Don't lose heart, Christian. Though your outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, they're temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Look at chapter 5, verse 6. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. The application for today is simply this. Live by faith in the middle of a crisis, knowing the foolishness of sin and the faithfulness of God. I want to leave you with a couple of quotes from some commentators. This one first is from John MacArthur, then Wearsby and Wolverinza. Ultimately, Habakkuk realized that God was not to be worshipped merely because of the temporal blessings he bestowed, but for his own sake. In a crisis, we learn to worship God for his own sake, not because he can just get us out of it. Weirdly says, God's glory will be established in heaven and on earth, therefore the just live faithfully. When you behold the glory of God and believe the word of God, it gives you faith to accept the will of God. Finally, for us, the message is clear. Stop complaining. Stop doubting. God is not indifferent to sin. He is not insensitive to suffering. He is in control. And in his perfect time, he will accomplish his perfect will. We are to stand in humble silence with a hushed expectancy of God's intervention. So Christian watching this, put on your faith specs. And look to God for answers in your crisis. Wait on God's timing. Live while you're waiting. Keep moving. See the future of sin. And believe the promise of God's glory.